All right, we're so excited about this conversation with Tex and Haram. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so excited because I know you three go way back and we're already laughing. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> we apologize in advance for any of these. Yeah, so it's just patient with us. But what this is evidence of already is just the relationship you guys have. And I'm excited to hear about how um, Doug has been able to be part of your story, but also how you guys have just searched for influence in your life and found really amazing um, people who have led you to now be incredible leaders and mm -hmm. fathers and um, husbands and all of the things. So Doug, you take it away. Introduce these guys. Who are we with? Why are we here? You know them very well and have lots of stories about Yeah, them. so we, we met around 2010, 11-ish, and uh, they they were part of a four kids independent living program. And so I got to know both of them and thought, these are two remarkable young men. Mm -hmm. And so we, we started hanging out at our house on Tuesdays, and uh, we called it Simple and Delicious. Yeah. And uh, we would cook, they would cook, and we would just do life together around our table with our three kids that were really mm -hmm. little at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just watching the two of you grow as men and hearing your story has profoundly blessed my life mm -hmm. and my kids' lives. My kids still talk about you guys. They still talk <laughs> about all the antics around oh, the table. Yeah. <laughs> and so what I'd love uh, for our listeners to hear is your story. Hmm. And and then some of the conversations we had around that table just to talk about the power of influence. So, yeah. okay. Rami, you're closest. So yep. to tell, tell us uh, your, your story. So um, before I met this amazing man here, <laughs> um, I was in Georgia. I grew up, I grew up in Florida first. And then that's where I uh, went through the foster care system because my mom and dad uh, were in like this crazy racist cult mm. that like kind of ruined our whole life. And uh, because of that, you know, we were just kind of in and out of shelter homes or in and out of school wearing the same clothes. You know, mm -hmm. you don't know that you're wearing the same clothes every day. You just get up and put your clothes on mm -hmm. and, go and get out the door. But, um, you know, going through that um, life, uh, promoted like a uh, caseworker to kind of like veer in and see that that's not normal. And we ended up in foster care and um, just the first maybe four months, I would say I, I didn't have a foster home yet. Cause I was a little old. I was nine. Okay. So, um, but then I ended up at a foster home and from like nine all the way to 19, this foster mom, we just stayed with this one foster mom wow. and that's usually rare. Like, yeah. Usually, yeah. Yeah. I could have been bouncing around right. all over the place, but you know, she didn't, she just like, nah, these are like my boys now. Oh. So, and, um, we got to just see her life and she was a, a Christian as well. Um, just devout believer and just having us work at like, just go to church really like, you know, you're going to be in this program. You're going to be in that program. You're going to be in this. <laughs> and just through those discipleship, um, just seeing like other men invest in my life, even when I was being in trouble at school or, um, just one and not none to do with my foster mom because I knew who my mom was, you know, those type of like comments. Um, like she still stuck with me, those those men still stuck in my life. Mm -hmm. And even though we moved, I still believe like m there were men out there like that, mm. like those men, you know, and I knew that someday they will come in my life again. And, and they always, the Lord always brought those men in my life, mm. like over and over and over and over, mm -hmm. no matter how many times I rejected that type of discipleship, mm -hmm. you know? And um yeah, I graduated high school and yeah. The next days was literally like they just came filled that that void right mm -hmm. right away. Like it was no time between that. It was just like right from high school I could have been partying oh nope. Mm, poor kids. Mm -hmm. You know, so so you lived in, like Doug was saying, an independent living mm -hmm. home yeah, independent that you moved into after high school. Yes, okay. right after high school. Because yeah. I could have I, I want to stay on my own for the longest time. It's like false kids everywhere. I don't want to see nobody no more. <laughs> like, I was pretty done with seeing people. I was like, I don't want to live I'm the same way. I want to live my own. I want my own groceries. I'm my own. Boy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm done with this, you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> so. Okay. So that's where you overlapped. And then text you also were there. So how did you end up becoming a uh, part of the independent living home? Well, I ended up becoming a part of the independent living home basically, basically because uh, I grew up with nine siblings and uh, part of the reason were that caused me to get into foster care because I got into foster care when I was 16 
is my father had a drug addiction problem, which caused a lot of issues in the family mm-hmm. and really made things very difficult in a uh, living situation, what uh, a way of things. Mm-hmm. And because of that, you know, there were some calls made and like an uh, investigator came to kind of investigate the situation yeah. and they deemed it necessary that, you know, we needed to be removed yeah. based on just the living conditions and mm-hmm. negligence and things like that. So I went into foster care at 16 with my uh, other siblings as well. And you, how many of there were you? Not, you said nine? Yeah, nine. Well, 10 if you include yeah. me total. And uh-huh. then um, the ones that went into foster care, including myself, were eight. Um, okay. My two older brothers were uh, 18 and 20 at the time. Okay. Mm-hmm. So uh, I did the foster care thing, aged out at the age of 18 years old, mm-hmm. thinking I'm the big dog next, you know, next yeah. hot shot. Yeah. You know? Well, welcome world. <laughs> we here, boy. <laughs> Let me embrace you. Yeah. You know? And, uh, End up working out. Not, yeah. not that great. Yeah. Exactly. W- one thing that um, you don't realize is um, when you age out of a, a situation like that, when you were removed from your family, mm-hmm. a lot of time, a lot of those issues weren't resolved. So now you're mm-hmm. a young adult now trying to manage your life, the issues of why you were removed and whoever was the cause of you being removed and trying to tackle all of that wow. while yeah. trying to tackle how to just live a normal life and be productive mm-hmm. and actually get somewhere. So my father ended up moving back in with me and some of my brothers and then kind of like the same issue started to arise again. Okay. You know, we got evicted once and then we were getting evicted again and I'm like, okay, text. I have aspirations. I have mm-hmm. desires to have a family and be a husband one day. And mm-hmm. where I'm currently heading, I see no way out. This this just blackness, there's no means of just mm-hmm. breaking this cycle. So I had I told myself, well, okay, I gotta I gotta search something out. Mm-hmm. And I had heard about uh four kids uh through uh one of my younger sisters who happened to be in that program at the time, and I was like, okay. It took me about a year to give it a shot because, okay. I, you know, even though I wanted to break loose, it still had a hold on me because I felt like my family depended on me. Yeah. And if I were to mm-hmm. just leave that, then well, well what would happen to the rest of them? You know, yeah. are they just going to crumble? Are they going to, you know, be left to the wayside? But I figured, okay, if I want to make any change in my life and in their life, then I need to break away from this because we're all sinking right now. Yeah. And someone needs to kind of uh, get out there and really establish some sort of foundation. Mm. So I left and uh, I became, I joined, uh, I did an interview with four kids to be part of an independent living program. And, and which, where also, I, that's when I gave my life to Christ and started understanding what it really meant to, mm. you know, follow Jesus and to be around uh, great men, people like Eddie Archer, yeah, you know, I mean, <laughs> kind of over here, legends. <laughs> you know, uh, it it really impacted me because I I always wanted to search out strong men who can lead me the right way, mm-hmm. and that's something that you know you don't realize it, but just sometimes just being next to a person like that gives you that that sense of like, okay, I can do it. It's gonna be all right, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, and mm-hmm. like people like Doug and Eddie Archer, like. Gave were were that type of men for me, and mm-hmm. also like Ken Lacey, uh, it was great. So and and you know that's where I developed my relationship with Doug, mm-hmm. who has <laughs> challenged me in many different ways. And, Interesting. Uh, fun ways, I yeah. call it. Yeah. Fun ways, lots of fun ways. Those ways. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead, Doug. No, so I say one of the things that you know happened early on was we we would and, and Suzanne and I would invite them over for dinner on Tuesday nights, and so sometimes we would cook, and then sometimes they would yeah. so. So tell us how you learned to cook. This is what we all want to hear. So I learned, I remember I would, we would go to the house and like, what to make? And I was like, I learned how to make tacos from YouTube. <laughs> and then we were like, what are we going to call it? Like, simple. Delicious. I thought about a restaurant. I thought about converting this to like this grand franchise. <laughs> simple and delicious. I would bring, I would bring all my ideas. <laughs> simple and delicious. Simple and delicious. Yeah. Yeah. Big idea, ten YouTube years. tacos. Yep. Yep. Okay. YouTube tacos, literally. That's amazing. Yeah. So you would get to practice this skill. Yep. Yeah. His house, Doug and literally. Suzanne and their family. Yeah. And then we would just tell stories. So like, uh, I think Har- Haram was over our house like five or six times before he told us his whole story about growing mm-hmm. up in this cold. And I mean, I remember looking at my kids' faces like Jackson, and Caden and Ken, and they're like, what? That, that they could hardly believe right. that someone went through some of the things that Haram went through or what Tex went through. And so at the same time, uh, you know, 
we're investing in them. They're actually investing in our kids mm-hmm. about just the reality of life in yep. the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The thing that's remarkable to me about both of you guys is that you had so many um, father figures who failed you. And in some ways, uh, faith or church failed you, mm-hmm. but you never gave up mm-hmm. on God and you never gave up on looking for those role models. And that mm-hmm. was something that I, I think is, is very rare that a lot of people get jaded, cynical. They just say, no, I can't trust anyone. I can't trust God. And, and you guys never did that. So, so tell, tell us like that internal thinking process of mm. what kept you searching? Yeah. Cause I did get jaded. Like it was like, <laughs> you know, and I, I think what I realized after going through, I think I realized it early on, like going through that cult of that guy that just mm-hmm. led my family to like straight utter despair, mm-hmm. like, you know, tithing to this man. He's saying he's Jesus and mm-hmm. he's not Jesus. You know, we give him, we reading his books, reading his, like, he's like, he's literally Jesus to us. So, mm-hmm. and I'm like, okay, what's the difference between going to church and then having this cult the cult leader you know like yeah. I, they were the same person to me at that age mm-hmm. and i just realized like well the main quality quality i saw was that jesus when i read about him he actually came to serve like he didn't want to be served you mm-hmm. know and like when i see that in someone i know that that's what that's what true meaning and like mm-hmm. you served us like you know you scott and all the you know ken lacy y'all were literally serving us like mm-hmm. just giving your lives and truly every day just investing in us mm. and so that to me that's what clicked a lot when i was younger like whenever i saw that somebody like trying to serve me and like dedicating their time mm-hmm. that time was big for me mm-hmm. if i saw somebody dedicate time mm-hmm. something that, that can't be given back that's serious to me mm-hmm. so no, that's yeah. good Tex, what about you you know uh, for me it was so i always had this desire to like want to have my own family and, and be a good husband. And I knew, okay, if, if, if I had these desires, if, if the Lord has, you know, really given me this passion to want to do this one day, there's got to be other people who can show me and teach mm-hmm. me how to be that way mm-hmm. yep. on a day-to-day basis. And, you know, one of the first people for me was just um, the man who oversaw the house that was in independent living, Eddie Archer, and being able just to see just how calm he was and just mm-hmm. how um, just how invested he was and mm-hmm. just putting time and effort in my life and just teaching and leading, it really helped me understand. Okay, so if he can do it, why can't I do it? You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. and. I don't know. It was just something that was just super important for me to just really just continue to beat down this path of, okay, mm-hmm. you know, th- there's got to be more men out there to really uh, invest. They want to invest in me and mm-hmm. I'm willing to just receive what they're, what they have to, mm-hmm. you know, say, and, you know, to mold my life in a way that I can, you know, could be kind of a stepping stone to mm-hmm. the next stage of where I need to be. Yeah. So, so there were some fun times, uh, you know, <laughs> skiing at the lake. We were just talking about that. Uh, her arm drank half the lake. Hey, geez. Yeah, yeah, I, did, I was determined to get up. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the, you know, the barbecue times, the fun times, but there's also some serious times. Yeah. So I know yeah. we, we, we talked about this one yeah, a minute ago. I, I give this word because part of the manhood conversation is yeah. it's time to man up. So yeah. talk, talk about where the mentorship becomes like a little more difficult mm. conversation. What's that, what that was like for you? Man, for me, I mean, it's always been like this just immense wrestle of like what I know I should be doing and what I'm actually doing. And Welcome to the human race. I know. You think and, you're doing it, but you're not. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, like you were saying earlier, you gave me a word called initiative. And it just haunted me for such a long time because it's like, I just knew like, okay, Tex, you just, you, you, you can be doing more, but you're just not doing it. You know, mm-hmm. and it's, it's it's just super challenging, but it's also good in the sense of, of like, it really forces you to, and it forced me to like, okay, I, I need to keep pressing forward. I need to keep mm-hmm. moving on as intimidating as it sounds, you know, because for me personally, it was like, okay, part of initiative is knowing that, okay, God is calling you to do something and trusting that he's actually going to do it. But my problem was this, I knew he was going to do it. I just didn't want to go through the effort of trusting him. Because, uh, you want to skip that whole stage. <laughs> like, Lord, 
I know you're going to do this and I know it's going to be a lot of work. So because I already know this, I don't want to do any of it. Yeah. Can I avoid all of that altogether? Sure. And, you know, it's like, no. <laughs> Sorry, you know, Tex. No. Yeah. This is going to require a lot from you, mm-hmm. your time, your resources, your effort. And I think for just a lot of men in general, like, we know that to get to the next step is going to require things of us. But yeah. we're like, well... I feel kind of nice and comfortable here, even though I know I should be over here, but it's going to, it's going to, you know, um, chip into my time or my personal space or whatever the case may yeah. be. And I just like feel uncomfortable. So it's like, <laughs> well, why force myself to do something I know I should do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. For oh. you? Some of the difficult conversations where it's like, Hey, it's time to man up now. I remember it was, I was, I was in a relationship like early in college. And I remember I called you about like, a, we, got, we got in an argument <laughs> and I had called you just to see if I was right, you know? <laughs> you see if I was, <laughs> <laughs> I remember, yeah, I was, I got in my journal still to this day. Oh. And um, I had got a tattoo, like a, like a whole sleeve right here. Oh, I and like, this. yeah, you remember, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah. and she didn't, and she didn't like, she didn't like tattoos. And I was just like, oh, well, like, <laughs> I like tattoos. Like, that's nothing to do with me, you know? Yeah. And she didn't respect, like, she didn't like that. And now mm-hmm. I remember I called you, and I was like, hey, like, she's upset with me. I got this tattoo. Like, was I in the wrong in this situation? Or, like, was, was she overreacting? And, um, and he was just like, no, you were wrong in this situation. <laughs> and, and he was like, he just told me, like, if you don't, like, respect her boundaries now, like, you're not going to respect mm-hmm. her when I get older. And like hit me, you know. I was like, "Dang, I, that's true. I have a wife someday, like, and she's gonna have also wants as well, and mm-hmm. and needs. And if I continue to just stomp over those, like, she's never gonna feel loved or respected, mm-hmm. or 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 like called to, you know, later on in life. Like, that's not later on in my life. Mm-hmm. That's something that I wanted, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I realized, like, I was very selfish. Like that moment like I, I started to recount a lot of things i'm like Damn, i'm a selfish like if i want what i, I want what i want <laughs> like and i will usually work hard to get what i want so it's like when i when i want it i'm just gonna get i'm gonna buy it i'm gonna you know mm-hmm. and sometimes i had to sacrifice what i want for someone else mm-hmm. so i never forgot that and changing moment for me i was like dang i'm not um Thought a man, about, I'm 25. I'm like, <laughs> I'm not as grown as I thought I was, you know. <laughs> so, something I love about both of your stories and just like your, I mean, your character and who God has made you is, I think you both have had a desire, obviously, to become what God made you to mm-hmm. be as a man, mm-hmm. and so you've sought that out, as Doug was saying. Mm-hmm. But I think is kind of like what you were saying, Tex, about the work that it takes to become that, you know, mm-hmm. it feels hard. I'm yeah, sure, especially from, from places where you didn't have the example right in front of you every day, you're mm-hmm. trying to gather it from a Ken or a Doug, yeah. or whatever, you know? Um, but obviously in that hard work, it's producing character in you mm-hmm. that you desire. Yeah. So is there a moment when you see that payoff? Like you're like, okay, I get it. Mm. They were right. And thank you. Like, I know today you would say that, but do you oh, remember yeah. a moment when you're like, okay, yeah, that hard thing, because I pushed through it, I see now what they were talking about and I trust them more. Mm-hmm. And that helped me to like grow in that time. I think for me, uh, one of those moments was when I was um, pursuing my now wife, mm-hmm. you know, for me, you know, Listen, I I used to be the type I'm oh. crushing on everybody, you know. <laughs> I was like, text another one, bro. You know, but another one, text. <laughs> my wife knows all this, but I, in my head, in my head, I'm like, well, I'm single, so I have, you know, I, I have an option to crush on somebody, you know. It's yeah. like, no, but one thing that really like resonated in my head is like, okay, well, first of all, if if I am to pursue a woman, I have to already beforehand have the desire to want to be a husband and a father, mm-hmm. you know. Because she needs to be able to see a vision in me that will lead her somewhere, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And I think that's something that was very important to recognize that, okay, I have a vision to be this. And, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, I want to I want to invite her in this vision mm-hmm. and give her an opportunity to partake and understand, okay, this is where he plans on going. Yeah. I see it. Mm-hmm. I want to be a yeah. part of it. Yep. So let's do that together. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, and, that, and, and I think that's something in terms of like, maturing for me was is, is something that I realized where it's like, okay, 
it's more about it's less about you know okay well she's initially attractive or I like these qualities or that qualities mm-hmm. but it's like it became more t- to me about okay what about her life actually lines up with t- the trajectory of my life mm-hmm. what about yeah. her passions mm-hmm. that I can actually support that are similar or or contrast to my passions you know yeah. What is it about our lives together that we can do together mm-hmm. and actually glorify the Lord throughout mm-hmm. this process mm-hmm. and understand, okay, if I'm going to decide to pursue her, then I am willfully deciding to sp- specifically just focus all my attention on her alone. Anybody else I was previously interested or maybe even slightly entertained is like, Cut them off, Tex. <laughs> I don't know you no more. <laughs> yeah, <Real>. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> So that's awesome. Yeah. What about you, Haram? Anything stick out from kind of an aha? I mean, obviously you're having these one-on-one yeah. conversations, but are there years later that you think, oh man, they were right? Yeah. Like, you know, like that were initiate initiative. Like that was my big one too. Because mm. um, if I would have just not actually pursued what that looks like in my life, mm-hmm. I'd be a totally different man right now. Mm. So actually pursuing what initiative looks like and what, that looks like for my family. I wasn't, like I guess I was selfish. I was all thinking about myself only and like where I want to go. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, actually, like that, it was helped me like with relationships and like mm-hmm. how I see women and and potential wives. So I'm like, mm-hmm. all right, if the vision, if we are not lining up to kind of go the same direction, then um, it's not going to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. So my initiative in that even shaped my family's direction, like mm-hmm. right off the bat, because I was already starting this shit in myself mm-hmm. to have a vision for my family before I even had a family. Yeah. So when I saw that in Doug, like just like how does he like command a room without like such humility? Like how does he do this? Like but because initiative, like he started himself already, mm-hmm. you know. So yeah, I mean one of the one of the things that's a setup for young men in foster care is they come from a broken environment mm-hmm. and people are like, oh, let's give you support, let's give you a check, right. let's yeah. give you help. And a lot of guys just end up becoming like it's like a victim mentality. Yeah. Someone owes me some sense of entitlement. Yeah. yeah. And you yeah. have to break out of that sense of entitlement with it's hard. I have yeah. to take I have to take ownership of my own life as a man. And I can't just keep putting my hand out. Mm-hmm. And I watch you guys walk through that process. Mm-hmm. And you became you became men who now you have strong work ethics and you're faithful to your wives and you're raising your kids and you're doing those things, not because of the brokenness of your past, but because of the vision God has for your future. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and my favorite part of this is not just that you got married and that you had your own kids <laughs> and that you delivered your own kids. Yeah, it's crazy. That's another story yeah. for another podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, another episode for sure. Wild. Yeah. But that yeah. in particular that. You, you guys have now dedicated your lives to invest yeah. in mm-hmm. other kids. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk about that journey because mm-hmm. now, now you're the Eddie Archers, right? Yeah, you're the yeah. Ken Lacy's. Yeah. And it, is that crazy it, or what? You know, crazy. When you see it, I mean, you don't look like, as good as they look. But, yeah. you know. We try, man. We try. We try. I mean, when you look at it like that, it, it is definitely profound in a sense because, you know, you never really know you're in a position of like leadership until you like, you, you really realize it. Like, you know, for a large majority of my life, I've always been seeking after like guidance and leadership, and you know, which is still important now. But yeah. then Even when you realize, so. okay, now the uh, a portion of that has kind of turned where it's like now you have an opportunity to pour out to others to kind of be that figure to mm-hmm. that people look up to. It's like you realize you have like a new level of responsibility of recognizing, okay, like what I do with my life and what I do with how I carry myself and how mm-hmm. I address other people or address mm-hmm. them actually matters you Mm -hmm. know yeah and the foundation that i'm setting them up for they may not they may not realize it right then and there but they will years down the line you know sowing those seeds of Mm -hmm. just like okay you know because you had this great foundation you know you're being set up for success in Mm -hmm. a lot of different ways Mm -hmm. this helped helped me to have even more Compassion even more so because I was in that in that position yeah. already. Mm-hmm. So it's like you're not seeking to like lead anyone else. You, you, compassion will never come up, but like it helps you to see your own self from their perspective. And like, okay, they won't get it right now. So it just have me. I just have a lot of patience for them. Like I'm just mm-hmm. like it's okay, man. Like you know, I see some high schoolers, and even though they look at me for more like training aspect of like you know football or basketball and getting their agility right. Like they still come to my house and they see how I raise my family and they see how you know, I, I am my wife and my and my kids, 
and cut you like or, or cutting their hair like how you cut your hair or how you you know <laughs> it's just simple little yeah. things that yeah. they just start to look up to and they just you know you can just see them like mm-hmm. you just and then that weight responsibility just gets heavy because like Whoa. right if i do something to deteriorate this like right. it will mm-hmm. cause generational mm-hmm. chaos yeah. you know so the weight gets more heavier mm-hmm. as more people look up to you yeah and i also so, i also would like to add because like one thing you start to realize is like especially like as let's say as christian men or as family men part of the process of mentoring or raising that next generation is like you have to be willing to be open yep. mm-hmm. to actually be a community because yeah those things aren't going to happen if you if your doors are closed. Right. Yep. No one gets the opportunity to oh. see how your family operates because that's one thing that always stuck in my head growing up was like, you know, you never really get a good grasp of like, well, what is husband and wife would like? What What is that dynamic even yeah. like? Mm-hmm. Like, what do arguments look like? What do mm-hmm. apologies look yeah. like? What do, you know, um, that dynamic looks like? Yeah. And unless you get the opportunity to be a part of a family who is like just welcoming and you get to interact with them on a day to day or week by week basis, you never get the opportunity to like Mm -hmm. get that understanding. Okay. Oh, I said, I always see him treat his wife this way, even though they may get an argument here, you know, he's always coming back and apologizing or they always come to some sort of understanding. Mm -hmm. Or I always see that they do this together Mm -hmm. or that, you know, this, that, so it's important because like unless you can see in an experience and for the person that like is in that position, sure it can be like exhausting at times, but it's important because it's like you're setting up that next generation for success because they get the opportunity to see, okay, so this is what mm-hmm. a Another husband example. is like, mm-hmm. this is what a wife is like, yep. this is what a family dynamic looks like. Oh, I wanna be I want that. I wanna, mm-hmm. you know, have that one day yeah. because you've seen it and now and you've had opportunity to take part in it mm-hmm. and it's something that like you it carries on uh you know even after for many years yeah i think that's the thing that i'm most proud of you guys is that that full circle of ministry is yeah. you have all these kids around your table you have mm-hmm. all these kids in your house watching you do life with your wife and your kids and you know i think mm-hmm. of that verse in second timothy so paul paul's last letter he's 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 about ready to die and he he says to timothy his like spiritual son he says everything you've heard me say and trust to reliable men who will then take that and invest in others. And he's talking mm. about like generations of discipleship. Yeah. I've invested in you. You've invested in someone mm-hmm. and invest in someone who invests in someone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's like the ultimate, ultimate influence. When you watch your influence, not just be like, Hey, from here to here, but from here to here, to, to there, there, to there. Yeah. To there. Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, so yeah. proud of you guys. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now let's talk about some of the real conversations. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking about like how you guys both didn't have those examples in your own homes. And yet in you was this desire for something like you kind of said to get a picture of it, to get a glimpse of it. Yeah. Yeah. And that gave you this like desire. Okay. Wait, I want that. Okay. I want to figure out how to have that. Mm -hmm. And now that you guys hold that, I know Harami said, it's like, it is a weight that you carry, but also have you seen like just some really cool fruit from it? Like to see the guys, obviously you're saying like, I want your haircut. I want your, but what it, what is it like to have a kid with like almost a restored hope for a future that they maybe didn't think they could have? Like, can you talk about what that's like just from your perspective? in that moment of seeing that they're, they're getting Getting something unlocked and healed. I I know for me, it it, it reminds me like, Oh, I still can be used. You know, (laughs) God is still actually doing it. Not done. (laughs) (laughs) Because I think if you're you're being honest with yourself, uh, oftentimes you wrestle with just your own shortcomings, Mm -hmm. your own downfalls. Mm -hmm. And and you you think to yourself, you know, am I really, you know, am I really making a difference? Am I, Mm -hmm. is what I'm doing actually changing life? Yeah. And then, God brings someone along where it's like you've been a part of life for a while or they just have a conversation with you and then you get reminded like, oh, okay, you know, Mm -hmm. I still need to be on this road because even though I may be dealing with my own doubts, you know, the Lord is faithful. He always will be faithful. Mm -hmm. And it's just one of those things like he's using me even in spite of my shortcomings, Mm -hmm. you know, and all I have to do is just be faithful, be consistent Mm -hmm. and those fruits, those seeds that are planted will come to fruition, you know, because mm-hmm. like 
my motivation can't necessarily be to see the result. Mm -mm. It just has to be to yeah. trust the Lord yeah. through, mm -hmm. through the process. And then if I see the fruit, fantastic. If I don't see the fruit, you know, I still trust that the Lord has done things in my life. Because I know from my own personal experience that, you know, I've been positively influenced by men that maybe I didn't even really speak to. Yeah. I just saw it from a distance. I kind of knew a little bit about their lives. So like, hmm, yes, I about this guy, yeah. you know, tells me like, okay, there's something in my, in my life that I need to change or I need to address. Mm -hmm. And it's just through watching someone just interact, be, interact or right. just someone who's faithful in, you know, being a man of the Lord. And mm -hmm. you, you can just tell, you just know. And I think the Lord uses the Holy Spirit to kind of speak to you through those moments of like, okay, sure. you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of what you, you've done over the years, you just show up. You just keep on showing up. Mm -hmm. Even if you bring your insecurities with you, you showed up mm -hmm. at St. Hayes. You showed up at yeah. Tosi as a yeah. leader. You show up for your the kids that are in your house every day. And whether you feel it or not, you show up. Mm -hmm. And there's just something about that. Yes. Te Texas here. It's basically yeah, Texas here. like a marriage. <laughs> you, you, you wake up and say... So they were gonna do it again. Yeah. <laughs> Courtney, but, he loves it. Yes. Courtney's thing. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> you know, but it's it, it's a beautiful thing when 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 you when you put the Lord first, mm -hmm. it really lines things up for um, success and for just a a a, re a relationship that can prosper and grow and thrive because mm -hmm. it's like work. We're connecting because we understand that I'm not your enemy. You're not my enemy. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. there are bigger things that we're fighting against. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in it together. We both trust the Lord through the process. Mm -hmm. And because yeah. of that, you know, we can both be humbled together mm -hmm. throughout our marriage and throughout things that we're learning because it's like, I would, at least for me personally, I always find myself in the, uh, the apology bracket where I have to apologize because, you know, maybe I was upset or whatever. But my wife is, she's she's just so patient with me and she understands, like, okay, he's going to get it. He just needs mm. a second. Just needs a time. Just Someday. needs a time. You know, he just needs a second. <laughs> and then, and, and, you know, oftentimes I've learned, um, especially just in communication in general, sometimes you have to, I see that, all the time, you have to put your ego aside and you have to recognize this person needs you to communicate with them and they need you to come humbly because then that's going to open the door for them to actually be willing to communicate. Mm -hmm. And now because we can communicate, we can come to some sort of resolution and solve an issue, you know? Mm -hmm. Sure, we might go through this issue a hundred times, but the way I see it is... Maybe more. <laughs> every time we go through it, the end result is just a little bit better than the previous right. time. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We can do a podcast on I communication. Say, wow. Yeah. yeah. We should have Tex come be our guest. Yeah. Like Dr. Listen. Phil. Yes. Dr. Listen. Tex. He's I not talk. a real doctor. I can, I can talk all about that. It's serious because, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll just digress, but, you know, it's, it's, it's something that I know for a fact in a lot of marriages, it's, uh, it's, it's a hard thing to yeah. Yeah. Uh, get around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Rambo, give us, oh. you know, back to the, back to her question. So, little kid or young kid looks at you mm. and and looks at you like you once looked at these leaders around you. What does that feel like for you? Hmm. Um, I just see you just you just start to see that you're giving them inspiration. Mm -hmm. Like and yeah. that's it's you used to notice that in, in, in person mm -hmm. because like you don't know when is someone inspired until like their behavior start to change. Yeah. And so like I remember there's one you remember Ansel? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this one kid answered when I was an RA. Um, he like stole my credit card and like bought like <laughs> a bunch of bunch of PlayStation games. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying. So I'm, I'm, I'm like everybody was getting gifts from my hard work, man. I was like, and I'm right looking at the bill. I'm like, I know I got more savings than this, man. This is crazy. And so I called the bank and they were like, yeah, it's a nice little stuff. So and then it was one guy in the house with PlayStation. So, <laughs> sure, like so. so obvious, you know, it was so obvious it was him. I remember I went in his room and I had like two choices. I could have blew up on him. Mm -hmm. I could have been so upset, you know? And I knew that he, like, you know, we had like our little tension moments because as an RA, it's like normal. Mm -hmm. But um, I saw like, I remember I like just kind of got on his love and I was like, hey man, like, I know this is not you, man. Like, if you want some game, like just... Just ask me, like, yo, can you buy me this game? I, I know you don't got no job. Like, I know you don't have a job. It's okay. Like, just come to me, you know? Mm -hmm. And, like, I literally saw, like, his expression, like, he thought I was going to blow up on him. Right. And I 
I gave him grace literally right then and there. Mm -hmm. And like, I forgot about that, you know, that moment, you know, two years later, I'm like in California with Chet and he called me out of nowhere and he was like, hey man. I was like, hello? He was like, it's Ansel. I was like, oh, what's up? And then he was like, hey, I just want to thank you for that time. Like, for giving me grace. Like, I'm, like, serving at, at my church now. I'm, like, serving at a church? Hold up, man. <laughs> Bro, I would never expect it is, man. And he was, like, yeah, I'm serving, like, you know, I'm trying to, like, get involved with the youth. And, like, he's in college days now. And, like, I was just, like, sat back in my chair, like, mm -hmm. so that's what influence does. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, I could have, you know, your influence, you, it could be good or bad. Yeah, right, right. So, it's, like, I in that moment, I chose to have a godly influence in his life. Yeah. And, I never got that moment, you know. Just like, man, like, I, I, I could decide a serious moment in that guy's life and my, and my choice in that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because so, if you think of the opposite, if you would respond, respond to you know, a justified rage mm -hmm. that could have set him up to do the same thing to people yep. in his life, or to never, you know, to not in that pattern of taking yeah. advantage of people or right. whatever it was. So it's really cool that you got to see that, yeah, and to mm -hmm. see uh, what it looks like to. Thank you honor God and honor others. So yeah. that's really cool. And now you guys are dads. Like you have your own children. Yeah, four yeah. girls. That's so scary. Yeah. scary. Yeah. No, that's the new. Never four thought, man. So Harami, you have four girls. Mm -hmm. Four girls, girls yeah. that you get to raise. Four life changers. Four life changers. That's right. And then Tex, you have how many kids? Well, I have two boys and then five uh, kids that were also fostering. So yes. three... Three girls and two other boys. So nothing's going on at your house. Yeah, I'll just say, yeah. invite them, both of them, to our house for dinner. Like, we're oh like, man, and it was crazy. Together? Yeah, we were. Yeah, so all everybody. Was and I was like, <laughs> we used to do this all the time. We were so tired. <laughs> yeah, so, it was like our man, turn to take over now. At nighttime, I tell my wife, "Oh man, we did it." And then I, I remind her, "Oh yeah, but we gotta do it again tomorrow." <laughs> yeah, we're not done. Everything's gonna be good. Yeah, always so much happening. I'm sure, and it's great because it's like. I recognize that the kids may not recognize that at the moment, but they're getting an opportunity to just do what kids get to do and just be kids. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's it's a beautiful thing that we get to have that opportunity mm -hmm. to build those memories that they can have and they can look back and say, you know, we had a great time doing this or doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, me personally, in, in relation to that, I think, you know, it's definitely something everybody can be a part of, you know, whether it's fostering, or whether it's, you know, offering your time, like Doug always says, it's just like get, being a part of the story. Mm. Uh, and I think that's like a a call for everybody who can mm -hmm. all do something, mm -hmm. you know, whether sure. it's once a day, once a month, mm -hmm. once a year. Yeah. Listen, no like, excuse. Well, it sounds like you both need babysitters. So yeah. that <laughs> hey, listen, <laughs> please send help. You say you come in, <laughs> I'll tell you yes. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so and we, our home is open, so we, we always, you know, enjoy meeting new people and mm -hmm. just because I think it's important for people to see just the community aspect yeah. of just what, you know, a Christian family looks like and just understand that listen, you know, if if you're coming to help serve us, I want you to let you, I want you to know that, you know, it's more than just serving, it's be, become part of a family, part of the community mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. that, you know. You know, you don't necessarily have to bring anything. You just bring yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to just hang out, and bring some cleaning yeah. supplies. Yeah, I heard that. You want to start cleaning up? You can sleep something. Sleep something. Yeah. Saw that, Ray. I saw you. Saw it. <laughs> but I think for most Christians who want to do good in the world, it just like it seems so overwhelming. Like I've got all these kids in foster care, these kids that are homeless, and I, I don't know what to do. But yeah. if if you can just get close enough to open your home. For simple and delicious, once a month. All right, once a month. You know, yeah. just say, hey, uh, first Tuesday of every month, these are the people that are invited to my table. Whoever shows up, shows up. Yep. Um, and it, that's just do that same thing consistently over time, and, yep. and you'll be an influence. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I love that, you know, you, you, you've both been able to create an environment in your home where your kids can be kids, mm -hmm. and they don't have to grow up in the environments you grew up in, mm -hmm. yeah. where either drugs or... Uh, you know, yeah, very broken violence, people. all that stuff, all that stuff affected your childhood. Mm -hmm. So now your kids can grow up and go, I, I had a great childhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. that's a beautiful thing to watch. That's the redemption yeah. of God. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so I'm asking every guest this season a oh, question okay. at the end. So I want you both to answer. Oh, oh. It's like the Jeopardy question. Mm -hmm. oh, all right, let's drink some water for this. It's long and hard. Actually, you don't have a lot of time. So, um, <laughs> 
over the next few years, when you think about your life and you encounter whoever you encounter, what do you hope you influence them to do or to be or? Oh, I already know. Okay, go. I hope to influence people to get involved in the story. Okay. One thing I always tell people, and I tell it with no shame, I said, listen, because oftentimes people think like, what can I do? And I tell them, listen, just be a letter. God is writing a book. Just be a letter, mm -hmm. be an A, be a B, mm -hmm. you know. As a community, if we all come together, you know, we're, this book is being written. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you just never know how impactful your life can mm -hmm. be to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is just be willing to give it up, mm -hmm. you know. Be willing to say, you know what, I'm going to offer my time, my resources, mm -hmm. my finances, whatever the case may be. Because I wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for many people coming together and saying, you know what, I don't know what I can do, but I know I can do something, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? And because of that, I was able to benefit from the Ministry for Kids who mm -hmm. was supported by the, the many people who saw the vision and said, you know what, I want to get on board, right? Mm -hmm. you know? So for me, I believe very heavily in just like getting to being a part of the story and saying, listen, you can be a part of the story. Let's get our hands dirty together mm -hmm. because if we do this, You'll be surprised of the the miracles and the ministries and just the people's lives that will be changed mm -hmm. from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's good. Yeah. Karan, what about you? Um, I would say I want influence people to make make them understand that not not to make them feel like they belong, but have the understanding that they do belong. Mm. So that, you know, because feelings change, like, yeah. you don't belong because I feel like I like you that day, or I feel yeah. like you did great for me that day. Like, mm -hmm. you belong because you just do, like, just in the whole gospel and God adopting us, like, mm -hmm. you didn't feel like doing none of this. Like, it was just like, I, I love you and I'm coming after you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I feel like that influence on their lives is, it just trumps everything, all mm -hmm. the, like, because Feelings is unfortunately like a crazy big driver yeah. in like mm -hmm. how we treat people. And I, I want them to understand that it's not about that. You belong regardless. Like, yeah, we're yeah. yeah, we going to go through some tough times, but you do belong. Mm -hmm. You know, could have did some, you know, crazy thing with Doug, but he still was like, all right, we still having something delicious. Yeah, he's still, <laughs> he's still, yeah, exactly. He's still, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> we still had something delicious no matter what I, you know, did or whatever. We just, he still said, hey, come over here. We're still having it. I love that. You know? Wow. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. I personally want to thank you because I know that sharing your stories on like any sort of platform, it acknowledges like that there's pain in your life that happened in mm -hmm. a moment yeah. that you should have experienced childhood mm -hmm. but i love that you are sharing your story because it paints such a clear picture of the redemption right. of god and okay. it's like so evident in both of your stories how when you just let him lead you and guide you mm -hmm. he he can redeem even like the hardest things in oh, life yes. and like make you advocates for yeah. <laughs> the, the kids coming up after you so i'm just really grateful that you guys would share and acknowledge where you were and all the ways that God has brought you out and now how he's using Amen. both of you. Mm -hmm. And he is. I know it. I hear oh. the stories. I see all the kids. And he's he keeping up with us, so he makes sure he's... Yeah, he's yeah. watching. Yeah, yeah. no. Like, really. Let's see. Yeah. Don't so, call away. Yeah. <laughs> Doug, yeah. any closing thoughts for your friends here? These... Yeah, no, I'm I'm just proud of you both. I mean, Thank you. You, you, become, you become men that other men are looking to. And mm. that, that just makes my heart proud. So mm. love you guys. Thank you. Me too, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So everyone, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Uh, hopefully it ministered to you and encouraged you. Like Tex was saying, everybody can do something. And so mm -hmm. I hope that as you're hearing even their stories and to know what they've, a glimpse of what they've gone through in their life and to see yeah. who these men are today, it can show you that your influence, mm -hmm. even a little bit, can impact somebody mm -hmm. in a way that could change their life and their future. So... We invite you to get in the story, right? Yeah, that's right. Look at that. Jump, Jump on in. Jump in. The water is warm. Yes. Sometimes cold. <laughs> it's not. All right. <laughs> With that, <laughs> thank you for joining us here on Seasons. We look forward yeah. to seeing you again soon. Thank you for listening to the Seasons podcast. Our hosts are Pastor Doug Souter and Kelly Hink. Seasons is produced by Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. And our theme song is Seasons by Connor Henderson with Calvary Music. For more information about our church or this podcast, visit calvaryftl.com.
だろう。